everyone is aware of the fact that Bhagavan has said this world is our, our life in this world is a dream. Um, this is actually a very, very um, key part of his teachings because uh, the core of Bhagavan's teachings are all coherent. Everything hangs together. And this is one of the um, key components of that. Um, so it's something that we need to think very carefully about, about uh, what actually Bhagavan means when he says the world is a dream and what are the implications of this teaching. Um, the idea that the world is a dream, many philosophers and poets and others in all cultures have speculated whether this world is a dream. And in Vedanta philosophy, uh, Dvaita philosophy, uh, this idea uh, recurs again and again. But it's interpreted in different ways by different people. A lot of um, scholars of, um, of um, Advaita have their own way of interpreting it. They say this world is like a dream, but they try to interpret it that it's not actually a dream. So they distinguish two types of uh, re reality. There's the absolute reality, well, three types of reality. There's the absolute reality, uh, Paramatika Satya. Um, then, uh, apart from that, there these, there, they distinguish two types of, uh, two other types of reality, Viviharika Satya and Pratipasika Satya. Viviharika Satya means the, um, Vivahara means worldly affairs, um, litigation, interactions, business, any, anything, any, um, any type of worldly activity is vivahara. So vivaharika satya is basically interactional reality. And pratibhasika means uh, seeming, seeming reality. And they say the, re, re, what we experience in waking state is, um, is vivaharika satya, and what we experience in dream is pratibhasika satya. That is, and they, they, from this they try to draw the inference, but in some way, this waking state is more real than dream. According to Bhagavan, this waking state is no more real than a dream. Bhagavan says exactly when we're dreaming, we don't think we're dreaming. We think we're awake. Just as we take, uh, 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 when we're dreaming, we take it to be waking. Now this is another dream, we take it to be waking. As real as uh, all the events now seem to be, in this waking state, in this so-called so waking state, so real when we're actually dreaming, all those events seem to be. So Bhagavan has said there's actually no difference between Vivaharika Satya and Pratipasika Satya. What is called Vivaharika Satya is just seeming reality. None of it is real. It is just, it is all uh, a creation of our own mind. And the mind is an expansion of the ego. So in verse 26 of Ulurunapadu, Bhagavan says, if the ego comes into existence, everything comes into existence. Uh, if the ego doesn't exist, everything doesn't exist. The ego itself is everything. Um, therefore, know that investigating what this ego is, is giving up everything. So uh, it, um, the, the root of all things is the ego. In, in a dream, we see a dream world full of people. So long as we're dreaming, we think all those people are, are just like us. They're seeing the world like us. But when we wake up, um, we understand all those people are our own mental creation. But not only were all the other people that we saw in our dream a mental creation, the person we mistook ourselves to be in dream was also a mental creation. So, and so also with this, the present state we're in. But that doesn't mean I am real, all these other people are my mental creation, because the I I'm referring to, this person Michael, is as much a mental creation as all the other people seen by Michael. But, uh, so Bhagavan doesn't say there are not many people, there's only one person. He says there, there are not many egos, there's one ego. That all the people are equally uh, real or unreal. Um, how, the, how it all appears to be real, because this one ego rises, 
identifies itself with a particular body or person. I mean, when Bhagavan talks about when he says, the ego is I am a body, he's not just talking about the body as a, as a physical thing. In Uludhanapati, in verse uh, 5, I think it is, he says, um, Udu pancha koza uru. The, the, um, the body is a form composed of five sheaths. Uh, all these fives are included in the term body. So the five sheaths are this physical body, the prana, that's the life in the body, the uh, uh, mind, the intellect, and the, the darkness of self-ignorance. Um, so all these make up the whole uh, entity called body. Nobody takes a dead body to be I. When the body is dead, nobody says, I am this body. It's a living body we take to be I. A living body means it's a body with all the physiological functions going on, the life going on in it, so the prana is there. And we, we don't experience this, even when this body, in the view of others, supposedly, is sleeping, we are not aware of it unless our mind is there. So we only take ourselves to the body when the mind is there, the intellect is there. All these things, they all are part and parcel of the entity that Bhagavan calls body. And this, uh, this experience that we have, I am this body, I am this living person, that is the ego. The ego comes into existence by grasping form. It, it stands by grasping form. But the first form it grasps is the form of this, this panchakos uru, this form of five sheaths, the person that we take ourselves to be. Um, and it, it continues holding on to this uh, person so long as it's, uh, well, in this state it holds on to this person. In dream it projects some other person that holds on to that person. And uh, then he, he says, urupatri um, undam, urupatri nikam. Grasping form, it comes into existence. Grasping form, it stands. Urupatri uh, undu mika ongum. Grasping form, it... Um, it, flour- it, it, it grasping and feeding on forms, it flourishes. Um, flourish or, or grow strong or everything. So we're constantly feeding the ego by constantly grasping form. The ego, Bhagavan says, is a formless phantom. So how a formless phantom grasps things? We grasp in our awareness. By being aware of things other than ourselves, we are feeding and sustaining the ego. And then he says, Uruvittu Urupatram. Leaving one form, it grasps another form. When we, when we wake up from dream into this waking state, we leave one form, we grasp another form. Eventually, this dream is going to come to an end. So we leave this, this body supposedly dies, but we never know our death because the, when, when, we die, when we die, we're no longer aware of this body or anything else. And not, this, because this is just like the ending of a dream, another dream will start sooner or later. We may for a while be in, as in sleep, and then we again, so long as the ego has desire to continue existing, so long as it has the shea vasana, the taste to experience all this multiplicity, it will rise again and again and again. It has to subside for some time in sleep, in order to recuperate its energy, to rise again and continue projecting all these things and uh, experiencing all these things. So when Bowman said this world is a dream, one of the inferences we have to understand is we are the only experiencer of this dream. So there is, according to Bowman, there are not multiple egos, there's one ego, and we are that. Once when Bhagavan was talking about this, this is called, in uh, Sanskrit, this is called Eka Jiva Vada. Eka is one, Jiva means soul, the ego. Uh, Vada means the contention of the argument, but there's only one soul. So once when Bhagavan was explaining this, um, there were a number of devoted present, and one of them asked, Bhagavan, which of us here is the one, is the one Jiva? Bhagavan said, you are that. And someone else said, but Bhagavan, what about me? Bhagavan said, you are that. The thing is, if we want to know who is the one jiva, who is experiencing all this? It is I. So I am the ego who has projected all this. Um, uh, we, we don't have to dispute with others saying, no, I'm the ego, I'm the ego. <laughs> because in whose view do the other people who is arguing with us exist? It is in, our, in the view of I, this ego. So 
there, there is only one ego. When this one ego comes into existence, everything comes into existence. The, we don't think the dream existed before we started dreaming or that it exists after. We know when we, as soon as we begin to dream, as soon as we take a, as soon as we, then simultaneously we project the dream body and through the dream body we project the dream world. This is all, it all happens simultaneously. As soon as the ego rises, Bhagavan says it rises by grasping form. But he doesn't mean the forms exist there and the ego rises and grasps them because he, he says everything comes into existence when the ego comes into existence. So the ego comes into existence simultaneously projecting a body and taking that body to be I and then through that body seeing the world. This is what happens every night when we dream. Bhagavan says exactly the same thing is happening in this waking state. Bhagavan said there is no difference between this dream and any other dream. People argue, oh, but in dream, um, things are so unstable. You know, one minute you're, I'm in London and the next minute I'm in Moscow or New York or somewhere else and I'm talking to someone and he's my father who passed away many years ago and then he's my best friend. Things are constantly changing in some dreams, not in all dreams. Because there's some dreams where you wake up, but it was so real, we wonder, oh, it takes a little while to adjust to the fact, but that was just a dream. So th there are different qualities of dream. This is a bit like um, a film production. We, we see so many films. If we see films that were made um, 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, the technology wasn't so advanced. We didn't have um, computer-aided animation and all these things. So we saw monsters or devils or demons or whatever were there. To our modern eyes, they don't look so realistic because we've got more sophisticated technology. Nowadays, if we, if we see a dragon in, in a film, it really looks like a dragon. Whereas in the 1950s, they didn't have the technology to produce such lifelike things. So better production now than in the past. But the modern films are no more real than the old films. So it's, it's a qualitative difference. It's not a substantial difference. So also, we, we can argue from the from our present perspective, but this dream seems to be a better quality than some other dreams. But Bhagavan always used to point out, you say this from the perspective of yourself in this state. If you were dreaming now, you would say exactly the same. This is so real, but when I'm dreaming, it's, it's so, it, it doesn't seem so real. But actually when you're experiencing any dream, it appears real. That is the nature of a dream. Why does it appear real? There is only one thing that is real, that is I. When I experience this body as myself, as I, obviously the body is real then, because I am real. If the body is I, then the body is real. And this body is part of this world in which it appears. So if the body is real, we can't have a real body and an unreal world. So. It is, it is, it's our own reality, but we first superimpose upon the body, and then via the body we superimpose it on the world. So what is real is only I. Everything else is a, a, a mental creation. That's why Bowen said, what is called the world is nothing but thought. What Bowen means by thought is not just the mental chatter that's going on in our mind. Thought is any mental phenomena. And according to Bowen, all phenomena that appear to be physical are actually mental. In dream, when we're dreaming, we appear to be in a physical world. We appear to have a physical body. As soon as we wake up, we no longer think that was actually physical. We don't think there was actually a world there. We, we are able to recognize, as soon as we, our identification with that dream body is broken, when we come to this state, we're able to recognize that that dream was just a mental creation. Everything we saw in in the dream was just our own thoughts, our own uh, mental, I mean, phenomena produced by our own mind. So everything is mental according to Bhagavan. So uh, there's a huge amount we have to uh, infer from the simple teaching of Bhagavan, but everything, this is all a dream, and it is in no way different from a dream. We have to infer that there's only one ego we have to worry about. We, we don't have to go out and teach, uh, save the world or teach, propagate Bhagavan's teachings or anything. If we, if we destroy the one ego, 
but we now experience as ourself, that is sufficient. If we are liberated, the whole world is liberated. We, we say, oh, this person is a jnani, that person is an agnani. This is all our own imagination because all these other people exist only in our view. When, when, uh, when Bhagavan was asked whether so-and-so is a jnani, Bhagavan used to say, there is only one jnani and you are that. See yourself and you'll see that you are... You, you, I mean, Bhagavan also said, uh, jnana itself is a jnani. Jnani is not a person. We think of a jnani as a person who has realized the self. There's no such thing. So long as we experience ourselves as a person, we don't know what we really are. When we know what we really are, we cannot ex- mistake ourselves to be a person. So there's, there's no such thing as a self-realized person. There's only, they, there is only self, ourself. We, all we have to do is know ourselves, be aware of ourselves as we actually are, that's the end of the ego, end of everything. That's what Bhagavan used to sometimes say. We used to, um, there's one passage in, um, in Day by Day. It was recorded just a few months after the atom bombs were dropped on, um, on uh, Nagasaki and Hiroshima. Bhagavan says, when the atom bomb of Jnana descends, all the world which is built on this flimsy or no foundation of ego all will be destroyed like a heap of cotton if, a, if a, a, uh, a spark of fire catches it. So everything, according to Bhagavan, it's all dependent on ego. And the ego is what we now seem to be. The ego is not... It's not... Um, it's, not we, 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 it's very difficult for us with language because when we talk about things, we talk about the ego as if it, we, we're separating it from ourselves. The ego is not anything separate from ourselves. What we seem to be now, that is ego. But though it's what we seem to be, according to Bhagavan, it's not what we really are. If we want to know what we really are, we have to look at ourselves. When we look at ourselves very carefully, when we turn our attention within, um, we, uh, <coughs> uh, we will experience ourselves as we really are, and therefore, this ego will be dissolved forever, and along with it, everything else will be dissolved. So this, uh, this simple teaching of Bhagavan, that everything is a dream, it has a huge, huge um, implication. And it's, it, it, it is a key, I mean, it's one of the cornerstones of his teachings. And he gives no room for this sort of um, diluted interpretation of the scholars, but... Uh, but uh, there's, that this is like a dream and that it, there's differences between dream and waking Bhagavan says there's absolutely no difference in Nanya he says in, in one paragraph he says except that waking is long and dream is short there's no difference but he also clarified even that is not true there's a verse in Guru Vachya Kukubai in which Murga recorded Bhagavan commenting on what he had said in Nanya in which he said even that is not true because time is only is relative. It's from the perspective of the ego in waking state, but this appears to be long and that appears to be short. But if, when we're dreaming, that appears to be waking. So if we were having this discussion in our dream last night, we'd be saying exactly the same thing. Oh yes, this is long and that is sh- short. It's, it's all a matter of perspective. But our, the problem is our wrong perspective. Because of our wrong perspective, we see ourselves as a person, we see, and therefore we see all this world. That's why it said, just all that is required is a small change of perspective. Instead of seeing our, ourself as this person, see ourselves as we really are. See yourself as Brahman, and the whole world will be uh, Brahman, and you'll see the whole world as Brahman. That, that is the meaning of that, of, of that, of what is said in in all those ancient texts. So Bhagavan hasn't actually contradicted anything that's in the ancient text. He's clarified the meaning of it. It's been misinterpreted for hundreds and hundreds of years. Because the, the human mind cannot but misinterpret it. We cannot fully understand this so long as we uh, experience ourselves as a person. It, we, we are trying to understand what is beyond mind through our mind. We will definitely misinterpret it. That's why Bhagavan didn't attach too much importance to all these 
um, uh, different interpretations and in these things. He said, that according to the purity of the mind, the same teaching will be reflected in different ways. If you want to know what is the truth, see yourself. See yourself and you'll see everything. If you don't see what you actually are, you'll misinterpret everything. So, the whole purpose of all of Bhagavan's teachings is not just uh, um, um, <coughs> um, just last week I was talking with a group of people in America about the second verse of Uludunapadu, in which Bhagavan says, um, all religions uh, begin uh, um, by accepting three fundamentals. That is the world, soul, and God. To argue whether these, uh, it, is the, it is one fundamental thing that it appears as these three fundamentals, or that the three fundamentals are always three fundamentals, is possible only so, so long as the ego survives, so long as the ego exists. Destroying this ego and being in one's own real state, that is best. So Bowen isn't, hasn't given us any teaching just to engage in arguments between a Dwaita and Dwaita, between this interpretation and that interpretation. That's not the point. The whole point is Bowen has given this teaching to turn our attention back to ourselves. We who now seem to be this ego, who are we actually? That is that's the whole purpose of Bowen's teaching. So it's all, all Bhagavan teachings are focused on investigating who am I, this one who now seems to be an ego, who now seems to see all this world. Who is this I? If we investigate it, if we look at ourselves very keenly, we draw our attention, but the ego uh, exists only by a grasping form, by attending to things other than itself. If it turns its attention away from other things, back towards itself, uh, Bhagavan says, if sought, it takes flight. Tedinal otum pidicum. It disappears. So the ego seems to be real so long as we're looking at anything else. When we look at the ego, it disappears. That is the way to destroy it. Because it doesn't actually exist. We can't, you can't destroy something that doesn't exist. All you can do is look at it carefully and see what it actually is. What, what is it that appears as ego and appears as all these things? It is only pure self-awareness. Bhagavan describes it in verse 28 of Upadesha Undia. He says, if one knows what one's real nature is, then anadi, ananta, akanda, satchidananda. Anadi means beginningless. Ananta means endless, limitless, or infinite. Akanda means undivided or unbroken. Satchidananda, being, awareness, happiness. That's all that is actually real. And it's not, though it's said as such and under, as if it's three things, because in, from a distorted perspective of our mind, existence and awareness and happiness seem to be three different things. Actually, they're akanda. They're un, undivided, undivisible. They are all one and the same thing. That is what we actually are. And that alone is real. Everything else is, comes when the ego comes. <laughs> yes. You, you said that um, just one ego yes. needs to become realized. Yes. Everything vanishes. Well, not become, it doesn't need to become realized. Well, it, needs it, it needs to look at itself and see that it doesn't exist. <laughs> right. well, what do you mean by a whole lot vanishes? I think you use like a, a spark and on the sort of cotton or whatever. Yeah. Well, okay. Of course, just disappear for that person or everybody or what? For, for whom does the world appear? The person who saw it, who, whose ego saw it. Yeah. So, so who, 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 is, who is now seeing the world? Well, that's a particular ego. Um, the body in which that ego sits. But who is, who is that ego? Well, it's part of the... Uh, Self, so you have nothing to do with it? I don't say, say that. <laughs> no, but um, it's you who are seeing the world, isn't it? Well, my mind is seeing the world. Um, yeah, but you, is the mind something other than you? You feel now, I am seeing the world, don't you? Yes. Yeah. 
that I that sees the world, that is the ego. But ego seems to exist so long as it is aware of things other than itself. So long as it is looking at elsewhere, not looking at itself, it seems to exist. If it looks back at itself, it disappears. Since the, everything else is seen only by this ego, when the ego disappears, everything disappears with it. We see this every night when we go to sleep. When we fall asleep, the ego subsides, and what remains? Nothing, Nothing just self-awareness. The ego, as soon as it rises in the morning, either in this dream or some other dream, everything appears. As soon as it subsides again in sleep, everything disappears. So, when Bhagavan says in Old Vinapku, when the ego comes into existence, everything comes into existence. When the ego doesn't exist, uh, nothing else exists. That is actually what we experience. But why we make a false assumption that the world exists independent of our awareness of it. So we think in sleep, though I wasn't aware of the world, it existed. That's, a, a, that's an assumption. And when, people, when Bhagavan pointed that out, people say, oh no, I wasn't aware of the world, but other people were aware of it. How do you know other people were aware of it? You only know other people were aware of it when you're awake. When you're awake, but every, you ask anyone here whether the world existed when you were asleep? Yes, they'll all say, yes, it did. But if this is all a dream, in a dream, if you ask the people in your dream, was, did this world exist when I was asleep? They say, of course it did. But when you wake up from a dream, do you believe those people? We, they, they, we, we, we have so many beliefs which actually are unjustified. We, just, we have assumptions. It, why? Because, as I said, because we are real and we take this person as ourself, this body as ourself, and because this body is part of the world, the world, whatever world we are currently experiencing seems to us to be real. It cannot be otherwise because we never see a world without being ourself a part of that world. When we're dreaming, we see a world. But we are not seeing it. It's not like watching a, uh, w watching a, um, a film on television or in a cinema. In a s cinema, when we're sitting there, we're aware of our self and the story there. We're watching it as something else. Sometimes if it's a really a gripping story, we actually forget that we're sitting in a chair and we, we feel we are part of that story. But in, 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 in waking or in, sorry, in dream, whether the dream we have at night or the dream we're having now, we always, uh, we always experience ourselves as part of the um, show that's going on. So because we are real, whatever we take ourselves in that dream to be, whatever person we take ourselves to be, seems to be real. Hence the world and all the other people seem to be real. Yeah, I felt that, but it was what you said about being one ego. And it just needs one ego to see reality. Well, well okay. What does it disappear for everybody? Well, when, when, you wake up, when, you wake up, when you wake up from a dream, do the other people in the dream continue seeing that dream world? I'm not answer that dream, then. <laughs> but, but, do you, do you seriously entertain a doubt whether those people you met in your dream are still there in the same dream? We know as soon as, as, soon as our, uh, our identification with that dream body is broken, when we, when we wake up, we immediately recognize that that dream was a mental creation. We don't think, oh, what happened to my friends in the dream? Uh, we, we were all on a on a journey and we didn't have food or water and we were all struggling so I've now got out of it what about them? We don't think like that we, we, we know very well it was all a figment of our imagination so according to Bhagavan this world is a dream 
So who sees this world? There's only one eye that sees this world. In the view of that one eye, there are so many other people, and we assume that all those other people are also aware of the world. When, when we are dreaming, we assume all those people are aware of the world just as we are. Only when we wake up, we realize that there is only one person who is aware of that dream, that is ourself. So also, according to Bhagavan, there's only one person who's aware of this world, and that is I. Who is that I? Investigate who that I is. And that, that, that I is now the... Well, the I that sees the world is the I that seems to be a person. When we investigate that I, it is not what it seems to be. It is just pure and infinite self-awareness. So once... Once, once we see what we actually are, the uh, delusion that we are this ego will be dissolved forever. And in the absence of the ego, there's no one to see any world. When we wake up from a dream, why we don't continue seeing the dream? Because we're no longer there. So when we find someone who attains this reality, yes. that's a our waking state now, Going through samadhi or whatever. Um, I mean, what is it like? You know? Well, Bhagavan says we cannot understand that. We, because we, as an ego or a mind, we are constantly aware of things other than ourselves. But Bhagavan says for those who have experienced that state, they're not aware of anything other. They, they, they have no experience of otherness. So, he, Bhagavan asked in Ulidana, verse 33, I think it is, who can, who can understand the state of those for whom, who are aware of nothing other than themselves? So, we, we, our mind cannot understand it. If we want to understand it, look at our, we have to look at ourselves, see what we actually are, when we see what we actually are, everything else disappears, and then what remains, that is what is real. Presumably, a jnani has a, a recollection, at least, of the waking state. Otherwise, he wouldn't be able to walk around. His physical body wouldn't be able to walk around. So, so, so a, you, you think the jnani is a physical body, then you're saying... When... No, 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 no. <laughs> it's a, it's a physical body. A physical body, which... Okay. The physical, the physical body, in whose view does the physical body of Vinyani exist? It only exists in your view. You say, oh, this is a Vinyani, this is an Agnani. You, we, 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 we see many people and we choose one or two and say, oh, this is, these are Vinyanis, everyone else is Agnanis. All these other people exist only in our view, according to Bhagavan. Even the guru, that's why Bhagavan used this analogy of the, the lion in the elephant's dream. It, it be, <coughs> um, elephants are supposed to be so afraid of lions that if they dream of a lion, they at once wake up. So Bhagavan said the guru is like the lion appearing in the um, dream of the elephant. The guru is a, the outward form of the guru is a mental projection. But the awakening brought about that by that mental projection is real. So the outward form of Bhagavan is a, a mental projection. This, this is not Bhagavan. In our view, we say this is Bhagavan. That's because we take ourselves to be this body, we take Bhagavan to be that body. But Bhagavan said, I am not this body. I am, I am the, the uh, aware... Well, he didn't say I am when he was asked, who... who who is, uh, um, because in those days there were some people who were saying, oh, Bhagavan is Shiva, some, Bhagavan, others were saying Bhagavan is Subramania, other people, was, they all had their own theories of who Bhagavan is. When he was asked in a verse, who, is, who, who are you? Bhagavan replied, Ariyati Tarajiva Dahabari Jagohail Arivairami Paramatuman Arunachala Ramanan. That means Arunachala Ramana is the is, is uh, the Paramatman, the, the real self, but is, um, but is uh, um, Rami means um, blissfully existing or enjoying itself as Aribu, as, as pure awareness in the hearts 
of all uh, living beings from Vishnu downwards. That means from, from God to the smallest ant, what is existing in each one as awareness, that is our natural Ramana. That is what Bhagavan really is. So this form is not Bhagavan. No form is... Bhagavan is not for... Bhagavan is, is, is beyond all form. But he, because we are looking outwards, he appeared in a human form in order to tell us, look within. You are that. See yourself and you will see... If you want to know what, who, who, who you, if you want to know what is God, if you want to know what is uh, the real form of Guru, if you want to know what you are, if you want to know anything worth knowing, see yourself, because you are that. Well, I think I understand those words. Yeah. But it's, uh, it's just that, it's that impenetrable step at the end. Well, yeah, but the thing is, it's, it's actually it's very, very simple. And the reason we haven't yet experienced it is also very simple. In order to uh, experience that, we have to be ready to let go of everything else. And we're not yet ready to let go. So the reason we are not yet realized or jnani or whatever, well, we are already that, but the reason we seem not to be that is because we're not yet ready to let go. That is why we have to practice. The more we practice trying to attend to ourselves, the more our love to know ourselves will increase. And the more we have love to know what we actually are, our desire to know other things will get weaker and weaker. So the, uh, when the desire for other things, to, to know other things, that, that we, what are called vishaya vasanas, the propensity to be aware of other things, vishayas, uh, that is the obstacle. But, but the more we attend to ourselves, the more those vishaya vasanas will get weakened. With every moment, at each moment we have a choice. We can either attend to other things or we can attend to ourselves. Most of the time, what are we doing? We're making the wrong choice. We're choosing to attend to other things. So every moment we choose to attend to ourselves, or at least to try to attend to ourselves, we are strengthening that sattvasana, a liking just to be. And we are correspondingly weakening the other vasanas. So but, but it is, what is, that's why it said bhakti and vairagya. They're actually just two sides of the same piece of paper. Bhakti is the love to know ourselves. Vairagya is the freedom from desire to know other things. So this, these have to be cultivated. They can, they can only be cultivated by persistent practice. We, we can, we can realise the truth here and now if we want to. The fact is, none of us want to. Bhagavan says, everyone who comes here says, they come only for moksha. But if I show a small sample of moksha, all the crows will fly away and I'll be left sitting here alone. <laughs> we, we have to be honest with ourselves. We, we say we are interested in this. We say we want moksha, we want jnana, we want all these things. The truth is we don't want them. We may have a little liking for them, but we're not yet ready to pay the price, which is giving up everything else. So we, that's why persistent practice is necessary. But it's also an ingrained habit. I mean, the habit of seeing things outside is so a part and parcel of yes. consciousness. Because it's, 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 the very, so it's the very nature of the ego. The ego comes into existence by grasping form. So it will continue grasping form until we finally get, we suffer so much, but eventually we, 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 we want peace, we want to be free of these things. But we have to undergo that process. You said, Bhagavan said, people are always, it's always the second and third person, it's never the first person. Exactly. It's the second and third person. Yeah. And you have to turn within yes. by investigation of yes. your mind, yes. persist, persistently yeah. inquire yeah. our soul. Yeah. Because we still have so much light. Yeah, exactly, exactly. We, 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 we take this first person for granted because the self awareness is always there like a background, like a screen. But we're not interested in the screen. The screen is boring. 
We want to see the pictures on the screen. Because of our liking to see the pictures on the screen, we don't see the screen. Well, we, we're always seeing the screen, but we seem to be not seeing the screen because we're overlooking it, because we're interested in the pictures. So we have to let the pictures appear. Bhagavan says, um, let the pictures appear or not appear. It doesn't matter. What we need to be interested in is seeing the screen. If we're interested in seeing the screen, the pictures won't distract us. The pictures distract us because we're more interested in, the, in seeing the pictures than seeing the screen. The screen is self-awareness, what we actually are. It doesn't matter whether other things appear or not, if we're interested in knowing what we are. The other, the other things become a distraction, other things are a problem for us, because we, are, we don't want to know what we are, we're more interested in knowing all these other things. That's why we have to turn away from the second and third persons, everything other than I, back towards the first person, I. It's so simple, if we want it. But who wants it? Bhagavan and Bhagavan says, the self-realization is easy, indeed it is easy. Yes. Although it appears to be so difficult. It appears to be difficult because we don't want it. Yes. Who is ready to let go? Our life, we all know our life is a mixture of pain and, pain and pleasure. We all have our problems, but we also all have our little pleasures. And for these little pleasures, we continue holding on. Because, there's another reason for that. Because of lack of, Bhagavan says it's avivika, because of lack of discrimination. We ourselves are perfect happiness. But, we keep on, instead of staying in the shade, we keep on going out into the sunshine. That is lack of, lack of discrimination. Because we, we, though we read in the book, Happiness Lies Within, who, if we really believe Bhagavan, but happiness, what Bhagavan tells us, the happiness lies only within and not in anything outside, our mind wouldn't go outside. None of us really believe Bhagavan, to be honest. If we really believe what Bhagavan had told us, we would stop, our mind would no longer go outside because there's no happiness there. Happiness is only within. Everyone is, we all want happiness. So we're all going after happiness, but we're going after it in the wrong direction. So how do we get the vivaka? Vivaka is discrimination or cl judgment, clarity. For that we require clarity. How do we get clarity? So long as we're looking outside, what we're seeing outside is, on, on, in, a, in old days when, um, when pictures were black and white, all the pictures we were seeing on the screen were, were just shadows. If, if, there was no, if there were no shadows, there would only be light on the screen. It's the, it's the shadows, the dark patches that make up the pictures. <clears throat> so long as we're looking at the picture, our mind is clouded. If we want clarity, we have to look back at the light, look back in the projector. Well, we are the projector in this case. Look back at, we are the light which illumines all this world. The more we look at ourselves, the more clarity we get. The more clarity we get, the more we'll be able to discriminate and recognize the truth of what Bhagavan says. But there is no happiness in anything external. Happiness lies only within. When, when we get that, along with Viveka, will come the Vairagya and the Bhakti. Because once we, un once we are truly convinced, and this conviction cannot come by just reading books and thinking about it, this conviction can come only by actually looking at ourselves and thereby uh, uh, clarifying our mind, purifying our mind, uh, the more our mind becomes pure and clear, the more we will be firmly convinced that happiness lies only within, not in anything external. So along with the Viveka will come the Bhakti and Vairagya. And that's all that is required to attain that. Because only when we've got that Bhakti and Vairagya we'll be ready to let go of everything else and cling only to ourselves. So we have to continue trying however many times our mind goes out it doesn't matter it's the nature of the mind to go out 
But however many times it goes out, we try and bring it back within. Slowly, slowly. This is what Bhagavan said. It's, it's like, we, we, we're not, this isn't a violent path like yoga or all these other things. This is a very gentle path. We slowly, slowly have to cudgel, like, like offering green grass to a cow to tempt it back to its shed. We slowly, slowly have to cudgel our mind to turn within, little by little. Sane sane uparameti, it is said in Bhagavad Gita. It says your, your, duty, your duty lies in practice. Yeah, exactly. Continuous practice of self inquiry. Exactly, exactly. You, yes. Um, you mentioned the word, you said, we don't believe by the word. Yes. Now, belief is a, <laughs> a word, isn't it? <laughs> And then in the 60s, you know, there was all this mass migration to India, all the Yeah. And they actually met these teachers and... Replaced one set of beliefs with another set of beliefs. Well, maybe. <laughs> but according to here, he said experience um, took the place of belief. And it was only because of yeah. Whether you judge that experience or not, you know, yeah. whether it was drugs or whatever. Yeah. Personally, in my experience, and I don't know, I think if I hadn't met certain teachers who I'd met, and, mm. and became really quite, um, you know, I had that experience of suddenly my mind stopping. And yeah. Was, I, at least this is my path. Obviously, we all have our different yeah, yeah. paths. Um, but without that experience, I mean, that was what kind of prompted me, really. Yes. And from the conversations that I hear a lot, I, I, I wonder whether many people have had that experience. Because once you've had that experience, these questions maybe don't arise. I mean, I, I will admit that I am not, you know, it's like there was this teacher, this is Trudy, who said, unless you want the truth like a drowning man wants air, yeah. you know, well, I yeah. don't think any, as, as you say, none of us do. So, no. But okay, <coughs> well, we just carry on. Yeah. But, um, but I think we need to have that experience of the mind being still, because otherwise, if the experience isn't there, you can keep coming to these satsangs and talking and discussing. But I wonder whether it actually hits, you know, I know. Yeah, well, I, I mean, as you say, we, we each have our own part. We, yeah. Bhagavan knows how to draw us each to this path. He does it, he handles us each individually, because he knows what our what are all our strengths and our weaknesses and everything. He knows what all our vasanas are, and he handles us accordingly, slowly, slowly cajoling us, bringing us to this path. So we will each have our story to tell, but the, the point is now we are where we are. Where do we progress from here? We have to persistently investigate ourselves. This is the way forward. Yeah. People think that they choose Bhagavan as a, as a guru, but it's the other way around. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Their minds can't, sometimes they can't get a grip of that. Yeah. That's the way it is. It is, yes. Bhagavan chooses. Yeah. Guru. How Bhagavan came into the life of each one of us, it wasn't, it wasn't our choosing. We, we were just very, very fortunate, but... Uh, he came into our life because he had already chosen us. But there, there's nothing special about us that Bhagavan has chosen us. Sadhu Om used to say, <clears throat> if you go to the, uh, the surgery of the greatest doctor in the world, what sort of patients will you find there? You won't find patients with cough and cold and indigestion. Because those patients can go to any... But the patients who are admitted in the surgery of the greatest doctor are the most serious cases. So because Bhagavan saw that we were hopeless, that no one else could save us, he had to, he had to come and save us. Yes. I can tell you, I don't know what I had. It was just, uh, of course, uh, nothing. 
But in this moment where I go, um, there was like a, a switch was off. Yeah. And uh, I and. And as you said, the switch came off. My powers. Your powers, <laughs> yes, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> and in that moment, I was terrified. <laughs> I wasn't at all blissful or, or anything. I was terrified because in that moment, oh, I'm losing everything. Yeah. Oh, it was like a really drawn. <coughs> and of course, everything came back. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, okay, I had just some bliss. Uh, period after yeah. that. Yeah. But of course the structure was very much there. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, so I think we are terrified of this. Yeah, we are. Just, we are. Uh, yeah, yeah. We yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's not something yeah, yeah. that we go happily. You know, no, 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 no. Beautiful no, no. It's terrifying. So yeah. <laughs> because it, it is, it is, this is suicide. We are on the path of suicide. Ego side. <laughs> because this ego character is only the I thought, it's only the illusion of life. Yes, yes. Yes. The illusion of life. But it may be an illusion, but it's an illusion that doesn't want let, to let go of itself. <laughs> moment, uh, <laughs> it was very much real. It's <laughs> terror of losing yeah. everything. Well, e even Bhagavan had that fear. It was that fear that actually drew, was the final straw. Just went yeah, yeah. The 16, yeah. Yeah. But the, the difference between Bhagavan and us, when we get that fear, our mind jumps out and clings to other things. When Bhagavan had that fear, his mind, we, mind went within, clung only to himself and let go of everything else. We will all come to that point sooner or later, but we haven't got there yet. <laughs> Is it possible that it just we we will uh, okay maybe some more some will get really through, but certainly at the moment of death this will happen. Well, yeah, I mean it it is it is said generally, but the moment of death is a very favourable moment because at that moment we are being forcibly separated from yes. everything we're attached to. We're not only being separated from this body, but from everything associated with this body, our friends, our relatives, our wealth, our status, our memories, everything we're getting separated from. So that's a very, very precious moment. So it is said the most favorable moment for experiencing what one actually is, is, the, is that moment of death. But we will be able to take advantage of that favorable moment only if we've been practicing throughout our life. Because if, we, if we're always allowing our mind to go outwards, when death comes, our mind will go and cling to external things. We'll be, we'll be, uh, if you, have you seen someone dying? Generally, when people are dying, you can see, uh, I mean, if they're dying, say, in a hospital bed or something, I mean, a natural death, there'll be, uh, their breath, there's a particular breathing pattern. Slowly, their breath is getting slower and slower and slower, and it stops. And all of a sudden they start again. You can see that happening again and again until finally it happens. Because we're not ready to let go, most of us. Yeah. But we, we will be ready to let go at that moment if we have been practicing this path to the best of our ability. If, 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 we, if we haven't been practicing enough, we will have to come back again. But what has been started, Bhagavan has started a process this process will not leave, even if we leave it, it will not leave us. We'll be drawn back to this again and again and again. So, uh, ultimately, everyone is going to, I mean, Bhagavan says in the eighth verse of Aranatya Ashtakam, just like the water evaporates from the ocean, goes up as clouds, it rains on the mountains, and it will not rest until it reaches back to the ocean. And just like birds flying in the sky, <clears throat> cannot rest until they come back to the earth. No one can uh, find rest until they come, until they go back the way they came. Uh, but eventually, everyone will get back there. That's the implication of that verse. So we 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 cannot rest until we reach there. 
Sooner or later we have to, the birds cannot be flying in the sky forever. The water that's in the clouds now, sooner or later it will all get back to the ocean. So we, we have to return to our source sooner or later. It's just a matter of, of when. Now we've reached a certain stage in our spiritual development where we've been brought to this path. So this is a sign um, when we've been singled out by the doctor for this intensive care ward, <laughs> we, we're, we're in a pretty critical condition, so it won't be long. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he was not doing. Uh, he was not doing uh, the Atma Vichar. Well, well, <laughs> yeah, was, yeah. But, but, but Bhagavan said about himself. He said, "Those who who seem to have attained it effortlessly in this lifetime are those who have strived in previous lifetimes." Mm -hmm. uh, you have to have this burning. Yeah, time. yeah, yeah. Uh, the only the people, the other people, apart from I didn't know. Because yeah. Yeah. Uh, realize. And there was nothing else in his life that uh, had yeah. any meaning yeah. except that yeah. wanting this, yeah. till even this wanting dropped. And then yeah, yeah. Then, uh, <laughs> I don't think I am. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying that, Bhagavan said that. And he didn't say directly about himself, but he said, he said in a more, ab I mean, generally Bhagavan doesn't talk about himself directly. He said it in an abstract way. Um, but uh, um, the, the, those who are seen to have attained, well, there's an, an, an analogy given, there are two analogies given. There's what's called uh, Market and Nyaya, Marjal and Nyaya. That is, one is the example of a, of a, um, of a baby monkey. Mon baby monkeys cling to their mother. Um, and the other example is of kittens. Kittens cannot cling. They wait for the mother to come and pick them up by the scruff of the neck. <clears throat> what Bhagavan says there, those who have strived in previous lifetimes, like the monkey, clinging firmly to God or whatever, are those, uh, sorry, those, sorry, he said, those who are seen to have succeeded effortlessly, like the kitten, are those who in previous uh, lifetime have strived uh, hard, like the monkey. So we have to, we have to uh, continue clinging, 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 until finally we're ready to let go of everything else. And then we'll be taken there by the, like a kitten. Um, but he also said, some, uh, he appeared to contradict that, say, for example, in the Mahatma's Gospel, where he said, reincarnation is not the truth. Reincarnation is not the truth. Because who is reincarnated? The ego. If the ego was true, then reincarnation would be true. Bhagavan said, when people ask Bhagavan, he, he said, he said, if you're born now, you'll be reborn. But are you born now? Well, they tell, they tell us. I don't remember it personally. <laughs> <laughs> My father told me that I was. Yeah. <laughs> well, it would be a bit hard to explain how you're here if you weren't. <laughs> But all this, as you say, we don't, we, don't, we don't actually experience our birth, just like we never experience the beginning of a dream. When we, as soon as the dream starts, we, have, we seem to have memory. It, it seems to be just a continuation of this waking state. So we, we're never aware either of the beginning of a dream or the end of a dream. It just... So, I mean, uh, my difficulty Yeah, okay. But we, we have to understand these in context. 
firstly, what is called re reincarnation or rebirth or whatever, according to Bhagavan, is just repeated dreams. And Bhagavan said, yes, so long as there's a dreamer, it will continue dreaming. The dreamer is the ego. So one dream comes to an end, another dream starts. But none of this is real. No dream is real because the dreamer is unreal. But in order to discover that for ourselves, we, have, we, the dreamer, have to investigate ourselves and find that we are not what we seem to be. When we find we are not the dreamer, then there have never been any dreams. But so long as we seem to be the dreamer, the dreams will seem to continue. So, uh, if the ego is real, then the rebirths are real. But are we the ego? Is the ego real? So Bowen is that he's talking at, he's talking at different levels, but he expects us to understand according to the context at which level he's talking. Did Bhagavan call it a jata? A jata is the final experience. A jata means literally it means uh, non-born. Absolute truth. Yeah, but, but the meaning of a jata is non-born, not born. Yeah. Born means every event. Every happening is a birth. So ajata means nothing has ever happened. Nothing has ever appeared. No ego has ever come into existence. Nothing else has ever appeared. What is alone is and always has been. That is the final experience. But though that is, though that is Bhagavan's experience, he, in his, that is not the standpoint he adopted in his teachings. He said the final experience will be a jata, but if, 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 if he were to say a jata alone is true, then who in a jata, who is there to say that, and to whom is it, can it be said, and why is it necessary to say it? So Bhagavan has, Bhagavan, though in Bhagavan's experience there's no ego, no world, so long as we experience ourselves as an ego, there seems to be an ego, there seems to be a world. So Bhagavan comes down to our level and says, yes, if this ego comes into existence, everything comes into existence. If the ego is not, everything is not. The ego is the root of all problems. Deal with this ego. The only way to deal with it is to investigate it. So Bhagavan, in, in his teaching, Bhagavan seems to accept the existence of the ego seems to accept the existence of the world, seems to accept the existence of God. Because if the ego is real, then the world is real, God is real, everything is real. The, 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 the root of all this appearance of reality, this seeming reality, is the ego. Investigate the ego, you'll find there never was any such thing. There, if there never was any ego, there never was anything else. So ajata has to be the final truth. But what Bhagavan taught is what is called vivatavada. That's the, that's the um, contention that everything is, a, is vivata. Vivata means false appearance, illusory appearance. So Bhagavan concedes, yes, there seems to be a snake there. But he, he, he doesn't concede that the snake is real. He accepts at least the appearance of the snake. Whereas in ajata, even the appearance of the snake is not accepted because to whom can it appear? A snake can appear only if there's someone to whom it appears. If we investigate ourselves, we are not this ego, then it has never appeared. So a jata is the logical conclusion of vivata. Because not only everything that we experience is a false appearance, we who experience it are a false appearance. So if we investigate this ego and find there's no such thing, there's also nothing else, and there never was. Uh, is that, does that answer your question? Because you, this has been a sort of bone of contention between Barry and us. Uh, and the, okay. <laughs> various discussions that we've had, this evident contradiction between... In a way, it answers the question. In another way, it just sounds utterly uh, incomprehensible. <laughs> well, this, this ego is utterly incomprehensible. 
How can a non-existent thing yeah. seem to exist, but in whose view does the ego seem to exist? Only in its own view. So it's a non-existent thing, but seems to exist only in its own view. Can you comprehend that? Even Bhagavan couldn't comprehend it. He said it's Maya, it doesn't exist. <coughs> when people ask Bhagavan, Bhagavan, why is, why is there Maya? Bhagavan said that's a question that no one can ever answer. See if there's Maya. If you look, well, Maya, the root of Maya is this ego. Because Maya is only for the ego. Who, who? Yeah, but Bhagavan is appearing in the Maya, isn't he? He's, uh, he's there. Well, well yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so, so it, it is, it is, um, it's mind-boggling. <laughs> the mind boggles itself. So we, we cannot understand it by mind. The only thing is, what is this mind? Who am I? Only if we investigate that, all these problems are solved. So in, other, in a way, the explanation is not an explanation, really. The, the purpose of the explanation is to turn our attention back to ourselves. When we turn our attention back to ourselves, we'll see there's nothing to explain. <laughs> yeah. So ultimately, the ultimate truth is Bhagavan's teachings are all false. The Bhagavan who gave the teachings is false. The one to whom the teachings are given is false. But what is, what is real, that is the real Bhagavan, that is the real you. So to see that, you just have to look at yourself. Everything else is false. Vivekananda said something like that, didn't he? Everything that he wrote towards the end of his yeah, life yeah. was just to be disregarded. Yeah. Yeah. I, I can't remember in what context. Someone was asking me something in, in, uh, in, in my blog, and it, it was something like, oh, you attach so much importance to Uludu Napadu. Uh, uh, you, you, uh, you, you say everything is unreal, but you say all of the Napadu is real. Uh, what I said in answer to that is, if all of the Napadu is real, it's not true. If it's true, it's not real. Because if what Bhagavan has said in all of the Napadu is, is, is true, then nothing other than our self is real. So Uludnapadu is unreal. If Uludnapadu is, un is real, then everything that it says is untrue. Yeah, well, when, was that, when did you post that one? I can't remember, I can't remember. <laughs> but but then, logically, we have to say that. If, if, yeah. if Bhagavan's teachings are true, they're all unreal. Because Bhagavan taught us everything is unreal except ourself. Teach, all, the, all these teachings, are, for whom are they needed? For the ego. If the ego doesn't exist, teachings, they're not only unnecessary, they never existed. So, they, <laughs> what is real is only Bhagavan. And what we call Bhagavan is wholly unreal. So, it seems a contradiction, but it's not. <laughs> um, he, Bhagavan said things to individual people to kind of hit the arrow into them, didn't he? Yes. And now we're reading all this. Yes. Obviously, it has a general thing, but it's not hitting our arrow specifically. I mean, it is, and it is. Yes, but the thing... I, Well, it, it's, it's true in a, certain ex, in a certain sense, but I mean, if we read books like talks and all these books that are called question and answer, obviously Bhagavan is talking to individuals there. But Bhagavan is also, uh, there's also a core of Bhagavan's teachings. 
but and there's certain principles in that. I mean, his, his te- the core of his teaching consists of certain principles. Those principles he has set forth in the most in the clearest and most systematic manner in three texts in Nanya, Ludhunapadu, and Upadesha India. So there, in these works, he's very, very clearly giving a decided view on everything. In talks, you may find so many things that contradict what he says in Uluwunapadu. That is because it is according to the needs of particular individuals. But what he's, what he's expressed in Uluwunapadu, Upadesha and Nanya, they are general principles which un, don't apply. It, it's not according to a person that it's true. It is true because it, it is, it, it's, it's, it's principles that are true whether we like it or not, basically. In, in, when Bhagavan is answering questions, he has to sometimes tailor what he says according to the uh, mind of the individuals he's talking to, because not everyone is ready to accept what Bhagavan says. So he's not going to say, oh, you're not ready to accept what I'm, what I'm going to say, I, so I'm not going to waste my time with you. He, see, he knows where they are, he says what is appropriate for them to lead them further on in the path from where they stand at the moment. But he also laid down, so he expressed certain general principles. Like some people have told me, because there's a lot of, um, a lot of people who read my blog don't agree with what I say. They don't even agree with what Bhagavan says sometimes. I, if I, in the comments on my blog, there are even people who criticize Bhagavan. But that, that's okay. I mean, Bhagavan doesn't mind. <laughs> people will always... Uh, <clears throat> but... Um, oh, what was I going to say? Um, oh, um, oh, yeah. Some, some people say, oh... Um, uh, Ulinapad isn't for me. But for me, the right text is talks. The one, one person was saying, because I'm just following uh, Bhakti Marga. Whether we're following Bhakti Marga or not, whether, whatever Marga we're following, the principles that Bhagavan has, uh, has laid down in Uludunapadu, it's not personal. When he says, if ego comes into existence, everything comes into existence. If ego doesn't exist, everything doesn't exist. We can't pick and choose that. It's not, it's not according to personal preferences that he's saying that. That is the, the truth. And when he says well, how the ego comes into existence, it comes into existence by grasping form, it stands by grasping form, it, uh, it, um, grasping and feeding on forms, it flourishes. When he says that, these are, these are basic principles which we cannot, whether, whatever we, whether we like it or not, this is the truth. If we, want to, if we want to free ourselves from the ego, doing japa, doing puja, doing dhyana, doing all these other things, may, if, it's, if it's done without desire, it may purify the mind, but eventually it has to bring us to this path. Because so long as we are tending to anything other than ourselves, we're, we're feeding our ego. The only way to destroy the ego is to look at ourselves. This is, this is a, whether we are ready to accept it or not, this is the truth that Bhagavan has told us. But I think he, didn't he I mean, maybe this is how I, this is my fantasy or imagination, mm. but he could, like, look into a person and he could see where there was that. Yeah. Oh. And then he would just throw that arrow in there, and what, it wasn't so much what he said, it was the end game. Yes. But Bhagavan, we, we shouldn't, some people imagine everyone who, who was with Bhagavan must have been very advanced spiritually or they'd all have attained moksha. But they benefited at their own level. But Bhagavan himself said, um, like the shadow at the foot of the lamp, there are people who spend their whole life in the presence of a jnana guru, but their ego doesn't, uh, the darkness of their ego doesn't uh, diminish. But that is not to say that they wasted their time. However, I mean, there were, there were good people and bad people around Bhagavan. There were people who, who um, I mean, there were, there were devotees who even, like Paramal Swami, even put court case against Bhagavan. And when, when he came to Bhagavan, and when, Bhagavan, when the ashram won one of the court cases, he came to Bhagavan and he was saying, uh, I don't mind, uh, I'm ready to take you to the... Um, 
I'm ready to take you to the higher court. I'm not going to leave you. Uh, what can you do? Even if you're God as you claim to be, even if you put me in hell, I will not leave you. Bhagavan said, even, e even if you go to hell, I will not leave you. <laughs> Paramal Swami, because of his attitude, he took that to mean that Bhagavan is going to continue fighting court cases in hell or something. But what Bhagavan meant is, he will save him. Even if he goes to hell, Bhagavan will come to save him. So, uh, pe people misunderstand Bhagavan. A lot of people criticize Bhagavan because this, this, um, this idea that Bhagavan wrote a will and left everything to his brother. There's plenty of people you'll find, it, particularly in South India, there are many people who say, oh, what sort of person is Ramana Maharshi? He collected so much money and then he wrote a will and gave it all to his brother. People miss it. Is it true that Bhagavan signed that will? The people who wanted to protect that property for their own reasons, they um, concocted this story or whatever. But actually what happened, when the whole will was shown to Bhagavan, and he, they, they read it to him line by line, and at the end they asked him to sign it. And he said, I never signed my signature. And they said, at least you put your line there. And he said, you put so many lines here already, can't you draw another line? <laughs> so then they put a line and they said, signed by Sambhashiva Rao on behalf of Ramana Maharshi. But afterwards, when, it, when uh, they were trying to get support for the will, when they asked Murugana, did Bhagavan sign, but they were trying to find out who is supporting and who is not supporting. They asked Murugana, do you agree that Bhagavan signed the will? But Murugana said, if he's Bhagavan, he didn't sign the will. If he signed the will, he's not Bhagavan. <laughs> but the, 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 the official story is that he signed the will. So, this, this, uh, so many people misinterpreted that. Naturally, they think, what, what's this? Is uh, a sannyasi collecting so much uh, funds and then giving it all to his brother? Naturally, people will misunderstand it if they don't understand who is Bhagavan. Pero. Maybe, maybe. I, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, there, there are a lot of stories like that. I, I, I don't know. It's difficult to say which of these stories are true, but whatever it is. But Bhagavan, Bhagavan gave him a great blessing when he said, even if you go to hell, I will not leave you. That is Bhagavan's assurance. But, and it, it, what Bhagavan said to him applies to all of us. What Bhagavan is there, he has come with one mission to save us, and he will save us however much we rebel. Once the prey has fallen in the jaws of a tiger, it can struggle as much as it like, yeah. but it will be swallowed, it's not going to escape. <laughs> yeah. He's a great Neanderthal. Yeah. 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 Yes. Uh, uh, you know, if uh, ego is real, yes, and the rest of the world is false, the rest of the world is treated as a dream. Whatever we do in life, you know, the ego, yes. if the e if the ego is real, the dream is also real. So if ego is real, dream is also real. If ego, ego is real. false, then Dr dreams are false. Yes. If dreams are false. Then how do you remove one false from another false? The ego character. There's only one way to remove... The, is the snake real or, or false? The illusory snake. No, I, I get that. The, but, I, if, but, okay, but, but, but snake, the snake is false. How to, how to remove it? The most effective way to kill a snake is take a big stick and beat it. But however much you beat it, it's not going to die. Because it's not a snake. There's only one way to kill that snake, is to look at it carefully and see that it's a rope. So the only way to get rid of this ego is to look at it carefully and see that it is Brahman, not, a, not an ego. I, I get that, but when you look at it, even the looking itself is false, that's what I'm saying. The self-investigation itself is false. Yes. Because you are removing a false with other false. Yes. Bhagavan said it's like, it's, like, it's like using one thorn to uh, remove another thorn. Exactly. Yeah. Is that, is that yeah. Right? Yes. And that's all we can do, right? What else? That's all we can do. That's all we can do. 
we seem to be this ego because we don't look at ourselves. We look at ourselves and we see we're not the ego and we've never been this ego and there never has been any ego, never has been any world. But in order to see that, we have to look at ourselves. It's so simple if we want to. So in that context, is it possible I can live in this world seeing the dreams without being a dreamer? No. Oh, only, when you, only, only when you're dreaming you see a dream. But I want to remain in the world seeing a dream without being a dreamer. You can want whatever you want. <laughs> is, it, is it possible to see a dream without being a dreamer? That's what I'm trying to see, whether it's possible, just you... <laughs> you're not part of the dream, but you're... Why, why set yourself an impossible task? Logically, you cannot, you cannot see a dream without being a dreamer. Isn't, Do you, isn't what he's saying, live in the world without being actually attached to the things? But, but how is that possible? We can only live in this world if we're attached to this body. And when we're attached to this body, we're also attached to our family, to our friends. To... There's no such thing as when the ego, how the ego comes into existence. Bhagavan says, Uru Patri Undam, grasping form, it uh, comes into existence. Grasping form, it stands. Grasping and feeding on form. Grasping means attaching itself to all these things. So the very na- there's no such thing as a detached ego. If at all we talk about being um, mentally detached or something, that's only relatively speaking. That's relative, right? Yeah, yeah. But I mean, um, you know, what you're saying is all or nothing. What we're it's, saying is, you know, the can't be just be like 50%. I mean, it, is it would be... It, <laughs> That, that, that's why we're not there, because we all want 50%. We want, it, we want jnana, and we also want all these other things. We want jnana, do we? Or we would be there, so the point is, we don't really want it. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Half alive and half dead. <laughs> but I, I, there, there's no such state as being half alive or half dead. Sadom used to, used to joke when people say, or oh, someone's almost realized. He said that's like saying he almost jumped across the well. He jumped 99% across the well. If you jump 99% across the well, where do you end up? In the bottom. What about all these so called people who claim it as some kind of illumination? Well, no, it's not at all. Bhagavan says those who say, I have. I, no, he doesn't say that. He, to say, I have known myself, or I have not known myself, is ground for ridicule. Well, they, they don't put it that way, do they? Oh, they, they, they will have all sorts of clever, they'll have all sorts of clever ways of saying it, but so long as there's an I to say that, that I is the ego. It's, we can claim anything. I can say I'm self-realized, or how are you to disprove it? But what's the use of me saying I'm self-realized? It doesn't do me any good, it doesn't do you any good. No, 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 but I, mean, I know some of them, and they are genuine, they've obviously had some kind of... They, they may, they may, they, if, if someone, if a person says, I am realised, it can be for one of two reasons. Either they're trying deliberately to deceive others, or they've already deceived themselves. Because they, people don't know, you read, you see so a lot of these people, this Chinmaya Mission and uh, Dayanand, all these sort of people, if you read what they say, their understanding of realization is having an intellectual understanding. They say you have to go through this course of classes, uh, step by step, and uh, remove all your doubts, and that is jnana. That's why it's in answer to people like this, but Bhagavan said in Who Am I, every book says the mind has to subside. But by reading books, you're not going to make the mind subside. In order to make the mind subside, you have to investigate yourself. Jnana, we cannot get jnana from books. You can go on reading for any number of lifetimes. You're not going to get jnana. Well, you... I happen to know one of these people. Yeah. He's a really nice guy. Very nice guys. I, I'm not saying they're not nice guys. I'm not saying they're not very nice guys. But... <laughs> And, and, um, and ever since then, um, he... Something happened to him, so he is still there for it to happen to him. Well, I mean, you know, I don't know exactly... Yeah, yeah, 
but I mean, they, people, I mean, a lot of these people, they genuinely believe they, 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 they've experienced something. But so long as there's someone to believe that. No, I don't think probably they're claiming that they've attained the highest. I, I just think it's quite interesting that, yeah. well, I don't know. I mean, you know, yeah. so I feel I'm so far away from that, I wouldn't mind having a bit of a <laughs> 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 you know anyone who is realised? You. <laughs> That's what Bhagavan said. That's what, when people are ask Bhagavan, when people ask Bhagavan, is this person a jnani or is that person a jnani? Bhagavan said, "There's only one jnani, and you are that."